So when you're converting sequence to SNPs, the first thing you want to look at is your data. It says, okay, what lines did we sequence? And David um, really highlighted that nicely. You know, there's SNPs that are coming from the processing type lines. There's SNPs that are coming from the, from the fresh market, some from fruits, rats, formated, the, the uh, cherry tomato types, and, and then some from pimpinol folium. Obviously, those different types of SNPs will have different applications or relevance to your breeding program depending on what your focus is. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about about assembling is um, duplications of genes are really, um, and this is where you know every plant genome has large duplications, dupl large portion of the genome being duplicated. Even Arabidopsis, supposedly the simplest genome, has about 30 percent duplicate, duplicated genes, 25 to 30 percent duplicated genes in it. Um, tomato, um, I'm not sure exactly what the amount is for the actual duplicated genes on that, but we, we know they're duplicated. So the data is only as good as you know, as the way you've created it, if remember we chop all the DNA up and put it back together, a duplicated gene looks a lot looks a lot like its paralog, and that's so some of the times you might be calling a SNP between two different parts of a chromosome, and, and that's something what uh, you know Dave alluded to that when he said you know when you only have 89 percent homology between two sequences, for example, you know that's a red flag. Maybe that's just a duplicated gene. I should just stay away from you know, that can take uh, for SNPs, and they're probably not real. And heterozygosity can mix, can kind of mix, mix that up as well in your samples uh, when you're assembling genomes. And this is just an example. This is actually from Day's work from Matthew Robbins, where he looked at, he clustered using DNA markers, I think these are microsatellites, and he did principal component analysis, and he was able to, to cluster basically the fresh market types, the open circles, the uh, vintage or more heirloom type varieties from the processing types. You know, and clearly they fall out into different groups with some overlap. But I just show this, for example, you need to know where your germplasm falls relative to these guys and which ones are being sequenced. Now Dave already talked about this. Uh, I think I'll just go over. This is what was sequenced with the different uh, fresh market and processing types. So how did we, so we sequenced these varieties, we used a luminous sequence, we got about 60 base pairs, we were able to assemble those varieties on their own, and we're also able to look at the assemblies from those ESTs, so basically from these, these um, basically they represent the mRNA, the expressed genes, we mapped them back to the, to the tomato genome, and we looked at the alignment. So that's, so we looked at sequence alignment, how, and we asked the question, how good do our assemblies match the genome assembly which is, you know, in a sense for now is a gold standard, right? is, or is the best we have for, for tomato right now because it has a physical map, a genetic map, and, and then a back-by-back -back assembly on it, which is better than just our Illumina assembly. So we, we filtered our, our sequences or our contigs based. We asked the question, are they 98% um, homologous to the genome, or are they 95%? And, and we put things in bins. And so that was kind of step one, so we qualified the sequence. Then we looked at the allele depth, you know, how many times did we see an A, how many times did we see a T at a given spot. You know, if we had, if we're kind of, if we're in an area where we only have three or four sequences, obviously we don't have as much um, confidence in that area to call a SNP than if uh, we have, in this case, looks like about 20. We, we used a base of 20 times. If we didn't see an allele 20 times, we, we didn't consider it uh, to call a SNP um, in this case. Okay, so and it goes back to the error rate, so you 20 times 1 or 5 percent, um, or 1 percent to the fold, 20 fold, that's our error rate in, the, in that, um, in calling SNPs. So pretty high quality uh, depth um, in our database. Then we looked at the allele frequency um, between the different genotypes um, that we sequenced. You know, how often did we see, for example, did you could have SNPs that are specific to fresh market, SNPs that are specific to processing types. Did we see it, you know, three and three, one and five, obviously the three and three, we saw three A's and three G's. We were more confident um, that that SNP will be useful in our germplasm than if we only saw it once out of the variety as we sequence. So we classified SNPs based on their allele frequency in the genotypes that we sequenced. And the other thing that went on, we designed uh, our SNP array, is we looked at candidate genes. Uh, we looked at about 2,700 candidate genes um, associated with carbohydrate 
uh, metabolism because part of the SOCAP grant was to look at sugar content. Uh, we looked at both, actually both potato and tomato. And we did that both on a, um, we asked the community to put in, to submit um, sequences and we got about 100, actually 500 or so um, requests saying, you know, I'm interested in that gene, can you look if there's a SNP in that gene? And, but we took it one more step and we used some of the tools that David talked about, the BLAST tools, and we asked questions like, give me any gene that has the word sugar in it or carbohydrate or looks like a gene that, that looks like glucose or something to do with a carbohydrate metabolism um, gene that was annotated uh, possibly in another, in another genome, um, anywhere in the, in the plant proteins database. So that came up to about 2,700. So those were the, say, the candidates that we looked for, looked for SNPs in.